the Americans are in Lebanon because the Americans are the leaders of the free world and because there's a struggle going on in Lebanon which has far wider connotations than the immediate issue of Beirut or Lebanon. It's a struggle between uh, a, a, a jointly sponsored uh, push by the Syrians backed by the Soviet Union in a massive manner uh, to take over Lebanon and with all that that implies for the defense of the West in the Middle East. I'm on the grounds of the Israeli Knesset. It was this parliamentary body which elected Haim Herzog president of the State of Israel during the spring of 1983. President Herzog was a longtime labor member of the Knesset. In addition, he was Israel's first military governor on the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. He was chief of military intelligence and is recognized as one of the world's great military authorities. He was Israel's ambassador to the United Nations for several years. During the course of our discussion, we naturally talked about Lebanon. We also talked about the United States Marines, and President Herzog made it very clear that American Marines are not in Lebanon at the request of Israel, and they serve no particular Israeli purpose by being there, although the state of Israel certainly has no objection to them being there. We also talked about Camp David, the Reagan plan, the Israeli economy, and on a very sensitive subject, we discussed the transfer in late 1983 of just a few Israeli soldiers for thousands of Palestinians, many of them terrorists with Israeli blood on their hands, and the motives and the thinking and the deep concern that went into the governmental decision to make that very uneven exchange, numerically at least. Mr. President, a lot of American pragmatists say that President Reagan and a lot of other people are really kidding themselves talking about Lebanon ever having a strong central government. And a lot of these same people say, what would really be so bad about partition? Israel taking the southern part of Lebanon and letting Syria or some other Arab country have other parts of Lebanon? Well, you're basically asking me a question which you should direct to the uh, American government because uh, <coughs> you approach the problem as one of the American government. Uh, basically, despite the very frail nature of its government, Lebanon for many, many years had a central government which somehow or other worked. And it worked because the various components realized it was in their interest to work together even though they hated and loathed each other. And from time to time, it exploded, like in 1958, when President Eisenhower had to send in 14,000 Marines. Not 1,800, but 14,000 at the time. But mind you, not a single shot was fired, and it, and it, re it restored uh, stability to uh, Lebanon. Uh, I don't think that partition would be a, a good solution. It may be that uh, things will work out that way, certainly as far as the uh, Syrian area is concerned, because they s show no indication of wanting to go back. But it seems to me today that the bulk of the leadership of the Lebanese uh, people has come to the conclusion that that's despite the fact that they can't stand each other, they have to live together and they have to find a modus vivendi. And uh, this came to expression to a degree at the Conciliation Conference in Geneva. <coughs> it's coming even more to expression now in the inter-community uh, 
discussions that are going on. And of course, the final uh, test will be in the Lebanese army, which is being reconstituted and being retrained by the United States government. If the Lebanese army, which is so far uh, giving a good account of itself, will um, manage to be above the ethnic and racial divisions within Lebanon, then a certain measure of stability will have been returned to Lebanon and we have a hope. But this, in my view, you won't know <coughs> the answer to this for about a year. Are the American Marines presently <coughs> in Lebanon because Israel wants them to be in Lebanon? Are they serving any purely Israeli purpose? By American the American Marines have nothing to do with Israel. The American Marines were invited by the Lebanese government in the first place as part of the multinational force to help uh, supervise the withdrawal of the PLO and protect them while they were going out. That was in uh, summer 82. And secondly, uh, to uh, uh, bolster the, the Lebanese government. President Amin Jamal published an article only a month or two ago in the Washington Post in which he specifically stated in the most categoric manner that the Marines were there at his invitation, at the invitation of the Lebanese government, and uh, that their presence was of vital importance to Lebanon. The Americans are in Lebanon because the Americans are the leaders of the free world and because there's a struggle going on in Lebanon which has far wider connotations than the immediate issue of Beirut or Lebanon. It's a struggle between uh, a, a, a jointly sponsored uh, push by the Syrians, backed by the Soviet Union in a massive manner, uh, to take over Lebanon and with all that that implies for the defense of the West in the Middle East. And you're seeing now a determined American effort, uh, which includes the Marines and the um, Sixth Fleet, to block that move. There really seems to be a dichotomy <clears throat> in Israel in the sense that Israel is greatly <clears throat> admired for the sacrifices they take in the field of national security. Yet economically, <clears throat> there doesn't seem to be the same willingness, for example, to invoke austerity. There's this great indebtedness, there's runaway inflation, there's a balance of payment deficits, and yet in Israel, there seems to be a constantly rising standard of living financed essentially by borrowing. Is that a fair judgment to make, for an outsider to make? <laughs> it's a fair judgment. It unfortunately uh, reflects a certain uh, given situation today. But I would say that somewhere at the bottom of the mind of the average Israeli is the feeling that uh, the knowledge that we are strong enough to overcome this crisis. And therefore, there tends to be a tendency uh, not to make the sacrifice that you really need at the time. I'm, I'm sure, I, I have no doubt that at the present time, we have no alternative but to make very, very serious sacrifices. And it's going to be very, very painful indeed. Uh, but uh, Domestically. Domestically, very painful indeed. But you have to realize that all of this is going on in an economy which has a basic inherent strength, an economy which can export to the tune of $11 billion a year. That's a lot of money, of which $5.5 billion are manufactured goods, is definitely capable of overcoming the situations that it has today. After all, what we have to do is work 10% uh, more uh, in order to catch up with the bulk of the deficit that we have in our balance of payments. Mentioning American pragmatists again, many of those people said that Israel really made a great mistake after signing Camp David and perhaps before in not creating a moderate Palestinian leader on the West Bank, the village leagues, since Hussein would never join the peace talks, simply to have someone to negotiate with to get Camp David going. And if that had occurred, there never would have been developed the Reagan plan. That wouldn't even be. And now, considering what's happened to Arafat, the battling within the PLO, uh, what Israel did in Lebanon, in effect, destroying the political and military structure of the PLO as some kind of cohesive force, 
Wouldn't you feel that now is really a rare opportunity to create or at least deal with that kind of moderate Palestinian leadership so that the autonomy talks under the Camp David peace structure could get moving, could begin? Well, you're assuming that there is a moderate Palestine leadership. Uh, I assume that there does exist such a thing. We are on record as being perfectly prepared for uh, Jordan to come forward together with the Palestinians and discuss autonomy within the framework of the Camp David Agreement. The trouble is that nobody comes forward. Now, nobody comes Why forward... Why doesn't Israel just push <coughs> that word forward? That's what because uh, I think it would be very bad because then they would be seen as quislings. They would be seen as traitors. They must come forward of their own will on the assumption, on the basis that this is the best thing for the Palestinians, not for Israel. Uh, they must come, they must reach a, uh, a, a, an understanding for themselves that what they're doing is for their good and that what they've been doing until now has been to, to, their, uh, to their prejudice. Um, in fact, and that's what's been their tragedy all the, the years. Uh, they've always been um, linked <coughs> or led by extremists who were unwilling to make any compromise. Uh, extremists who were never willing to accept less than 100% of their demands. Uh, now I feel that after what's happening within the PLO, and after the takeover of the PLO by the Syrians, it'll become an instrument of Syrian policy, uh, we may begin to see uh, the sprouting of an indigenous leadership in the West Bank and Gaza which uh, is prepared, first of all, for compromise as a principle. doesn't matter how much. But so far to this day, no Arab leader in the context of the Palestinian struggle has ever come forward and said, I'm prepared for compromise. So who are these, I'm prepared who are, to discuss. Who are these moderates that America keeps talking about? They keep they saying are, that <coughs> Hussein is a moderate and Saudi Arabia Hussein is a moderate. Is, Hussein is a moderate, but he doesn't seem to have the courage to come forward and uh, draw the conclusions from his moderation. I mean, he probably his own private opinions, as expressed and as published, do show a degree of moderation and a degree of acceptance of Israel and willing to nego willingness to negotiate. But between that and actually coming forward to negotiate, there's a big distance. And uh, the same is true. I think there is a moderate Arab leadership. I meet with them, I see them, I talk to them. Uh, I have a feeling until now they've been afraid to come forward to come out openly in favor of some sort of moderation. Now, uh, since the split in the PLO, one senses, one more than senses because one reads articles in the free Arab press, it's the only free Arab press in the Middle East, is the one we've got here. But you see articles in the press, you meet with leaders, you hear uh, comments by them at public meetings. All of these seem to show that we are in the process of seeing a, a tendency towards compromise. I don't know if it'll happen. I don't know if they won't be again struck down by the assassin's bullet as they have until now. But uh, let's put it this way, the atmosphere seems to be better. I don't know how well aware you are of this fact, but when the Reagan, uh, President Reagan first announced his new peace initiative, in September of 1982, there was a great deal of conflict within the American Jewish community because many uh, federation leaders, many ostensible leaders, voices for the American Jewish community praised certain positive parts of the Reagan plan, whereas there was another segment of the American Jewish community that said the Reagan plan is an absolute stab in the back to the state of Israel. Israel gave up the Sinai. They gave up the oil, they gave up some of the most sophisticated bases in the world, basically for Sadat's signature. The autonomy talks were to begin. No Arab leader, as you said, came forth one step. So again, America is basically rewarding the so-called moderates with a new plan, which obviously talks about sovereignty for the Arabs on the West Bank, prejudging that whole issue whereas Camp David talked about a transitional period of autonomy, which is obviously a great deal different than, than sovereignty. The fact is that the government of Israel, which is in uh, power today, uh, rejected uh, that plan. 
Uh, and uh, what my views are about that is not relevant at this moment. Certainly, I'm, I don't intend to uh, hold forth on the subject. But what I would say is that there is plenty of room within the framework of Camp David to move forward. And uh, our general feeling has been that uh, it's been held up because the Egyptians say today, who, and we have a letter from President Sadat saying that the process has to go on, and that he wants to continue the negotiations uh, in respect of uh, Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. Uh, but uh, the new Syrian, uh, the new Egyptian government uh, feel that they do not want to renew the Camp David uh, talks, the autonomy talks, until the Jordanians and the Palestinians agree to join in with them. In other words, the difference between President Sadat's policy and President Mubarak's policy is that President Sadat was willing to go it alone and bring it to a conclusion and then present it to the Palestinians with a take it or leave it uh, message. Uh, President Mubarak wants to go along together with the Jordanians and the Palestinians. As far as we're concerned, that's fine. The only problem is that the Jordanians and the Palestinians are not willing to move forward to the negotiations. So we are in a vicious circle. And I have a feeling that now, as soon as the uh, PLO is completely taken over by Syria, and that seems to be the trend, uh, and will be the ultimate result, I would estimate, uh, then it may be possible to go to the Palestinians and say, for goodness sake, sit down and talk about your future. You have refused all the years to talk about your future. Why, who are you blaming, if not yourselves? Mr. President, in view of the deal that Israel made with the PLO to exchange six Israeli soldiers for thousands of Palestinian prisoners and for about a hundred convicted terrorists, how can Israel ever be in the position again to criticize European nations <coughs> or the United States or any other country for giving in to blackmail and terror? Because it seems as though that's what Israel did in this instance. No, I wouldn't say uh, that's the... Uh, you ca I wouldn't say that you can really uh, liken one to the other. Uh, those who were taken in uh, and were in Lebanon, the bulk of the, pro bulk of the problem, uh, they were never sentenced. <coughs> They're being held uh, as suspects. In fact, to a degree, you can look upon them as prisoners of war. Uh, the Red Cross was admitted to the camp, and while formally we did not recognize them as prisoners of war under the Geneva Convention, uh, in fact, uh, we treated them as such. Uh, all the procedures in the camps were as in a uh, prisoner of war camp. And uh, <coughs> as I say, the, Geneva, the, the Red Cross had a permanent representation there, visited them, reported on them, and so forth. So basically, what you had, <coughs> in other words, was an exchange of prisoners. Now you had, it's true, about a hundred here in Israel, most of whom have spent a very, very considerable period in jail. Uh, and uh, it's true, there was an element of pressure here, but you had the uh, problem of the uh, standards of of human relationship in Israel, uh, which is reflected in the feeling for every boy, whether he's a prisoner or, or if he falls, uh, against uh, allowing them off part of the time. And uh, it worked to a degree, you could say, there was a very considerable amount of pressure here. To a degree, you could say that this again shows the uh, very considerable uh, standard of civilization in human relationships within Israel one would not have to be a great prognosticator to predict a, a terrible thing, but which probably will, will occur, that out of these thousands, they will certainly be responsible at some point in time for the deaths, tragically, of more than six Israelis. I hope not, but of course I'm not prepared to argue with you on that. Look, you can take it even further. In the Six-Day War, <coughs> we had about 6,000 Egyptian prisoners of war, and they had uh, 
a very small number, I can't remember how many it was, but I don't remember, it was 20, 30 Israeli prisoners uh, of war, and uh, we exchanged them. In the uh, Sinai campaign, we had 5,000 Egyptian prisoners of war, they had nine prisoners of war, and we exchanged them. There was no guarantee to us that we wouldn't, uh, as a matter of fact, in the Six-Day War, we met people who had been prisoners, we took prisoner again, people who had been prisoners in the Sinai campaign. You have no guarantee that you're uh, going to, uh, uh, that uh, it, it's, it's all going to be so simple. When I interviewed former Prime Minister Rabin, he made a very interesting comment, looking at the background of the present tragedy in Lebanon, a civil war existing for some seven years, the decimation of many, many Christian communities, Zali, Damour. Of course, one thing every Israeli points out is the double standard in the press. The press and NBC and CBS and the American media did not become tremendously interested in the devastation and death until some of it was being perpetrated by the Israelis. But the thing that struck Rabin very, very much was the fact that thousands upon thousands of Lebanese Christians were being slaughtered. And with all the power, both moral, political, and military, of the Christian world, not a Christian country lifted their finger. And he saw a great irony in the fact that the Lebanese Christians could ultimately go to one place and one people for assistance against such slaughter, and that was to Israel. Based on your experience in the United Nations and your wide travels, do you have an explanation as, as to how the Pope could remain silent, as to how Christian countries could let this go on and do nothing, not even say anything of any great significance during the period it was occurring? Uh, I find it very, very difficult to explain. I was at the UN three years, <clears throat> from 75 to 78. Uh, from the beginning of the Lebanese Civil War, in fact, right on, for, for three years. I was the only voice in the UN. Every single speech I made, I raised the question of, uh, and why was the Christian world silent? Uh, I went for them at, on every sing possible occasion. It reached a stage that uh, I took advantage of every situation to raise it in the Security Council. The Arabs, in the end, began to drop their very frequent requests for Security Council meetings to condemn Israel. After Entebbe, a long, long period passed before they asked again. One of the reasons was they saw that we were taking advantage of this, and it was embarrassing all the countries of the world. Uh, I can't explain the silence of the, uh, of the Pope or of uh, the Vatican on uh, this issue. I'm not only saying it to you, I've said it on Italian television. Uh, that I just don't understand it, and I never will understand it. I've had missions here of uh, Lebanese Christians, uh, the heads of their communities. They've been to see the Pope. They've asked, why, is, why are they silent? Uh, you had massacres here in which Christians were crowded into a church, in which the priest was slaughtered on the altar in uh, Aisha, near, not far from our border. Unbelievable thing in which the whole community was slaughtered there in the, in the church. And yet the Christian world was absolutely silent. And uh, if one child, if one girl had been taken prisoner by an Israeli soldier there and uh, held uh, on her way to uh, jail, as happened in the West Bank, the entire Western press would have had it on the front page. Yeah, that's, exa that's exactly what happened in the West Bank. An Israeli soldier pulled uh, an Arab girl by her hair, and that roused the entire world. And a massacre of a total Christian population in uh, the village of Aishia in, in Lebanon, in the church, didn't merit one sentence in any of the Western press. And no one's given you an answer either at, Nobody, the, either at the UN or, or since? Nowhere. Nobody's given me an answer. Has anyone given well, you, you? You had, look, you had uh, the uproar about Sabra and Shatila, which was a terrible thing, uh, a year and a half ago. Because, the, uh, because it was, Israel was conceived to be 
to be ir indirectly responsible. Everybody knew that the Falangist Christians did it. But because the Israeli force, it was in the area controlled by the Israeli forces, Israel was conceived to be, and therefore the whole world was on its ears. You had much worse massacres now, not far from Sabra and Shatila, in uh, the Shuf Mountains, on both sides, both Druze against Christian, Christian against Druze. You hardly saw anything about it in the, uh, in the press world. At the moment, I'm talking now, there are about 30 to 40,000 Christian men, women, and children besieged in Deir el Kamer, in a township in the Shuf Mountains, uh, with winter approaching, in uh, the snow very coming on very soon, in the most terrible conditions. Have you heard a word about it in the, in, the, uh, in the world? You've been for a long time, many years, associated with the Labour Party. Obviously, you've had a great many dealings with Prime Minister Begin, both when he was out of power and after he came into power. Can you give the American public any insight on what has happened to the man? All we hear in America is that he was so depressed about his wife's death and the loss of life in Lebanon that he has simply become a hermit. I can't explain it. I'm very. I'm sorry. He's, uh, it's true. He suffers from this uh, skin disease, which makes it impossible for him to shave, and uh, affects his whole face. So I gather from his close confidants who do visit him. Uh, when you speak to him on the phone, it's the same, Mr. Bacon. No it difference. is. Yes, absolutely. And does he I take not calls? And he, he takes calls, and I have not distinguished any change in his whole approach, in his voice or anything. Uh, on the other hand, he's a, uh, uh, he is obviously depressed, and that was evident to everybody, both by what happened in his family and uh, by uh, the losses in Lebanon. It seems all to have... Uh, weighed down on him together with the burdens of government and the burdens of government in a country such as Israel are very, very heavy indeed. And it's had its effect. Uh, I can't uh, tell you any more because I haven't seen him. Mr. President, thank you very You're much. You're welcome.